me now in turning to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we are going to do a great deal of page turning this morning, much more than we usually do. Uh, because, uh, well, let me just give you a little bit of, of uh, homiletics here. And I know you say, what language was that? Um, homiletics is the study of the preparation and delivery of a sermon. Okay, and there are different kinds of sermons, different types. Uh, usually what we do here is an expository sermon where you take a passage of scripture and you expound it. There is also a textual sermon where you take just maybe one or two verses of scripture and you focus uh, specifically on that and the truth that's in it. All of these are valid, by the way. And then there's a topical sermon, and that's where you take a topic and you follow it through scripture. And that's what we're doing this morning. But normally we're doing an expository message. Today we do a topical message. And it's probably far more technical than most of you want me to get. But uh, <laughs> just, just kind of share some of that with you. All right. Genesis chapter 3. And to begin with, I want us to read verse 20. Verse 20. Genesis 3.20. And then we'll pray. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have your word. Pray that we'd always be able to have your word, to have personal copies of it that we can hold in our hands, that we can read in a language that we can understand, and through which, Lord, you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. And we pray for that self same Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth now. And we pray, Lord, that for the next few moments, you'd help us just to focus upon your word and upon the message that you would have for us this morning as we seek first to lift up Jesus and then to honor our mothers. And Lord, we just pray as always, and we've already asked this morning, we ask again, if there's a soul listening who doesn't know you, we pray that they would come to trust Jesus as their Savior in this hour. Lord, for those who do know you, encourage us, strengthen us, lift us up, and help us to be grateful for and to honor our mothers. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We've heard a great deal in recent days about essential services and essential jobs. Now, obviously, there are services and jobs that are essential. I'm of the opinion that most jobs are essential, in, in one way or another, and, and usually in many ways. But I think that without question, one of the most essential services and one of the most essential jobs in the world is the job of mothers. You, you think about that. Now, you, you don't have to think very long about this one. If it weren't for your mother, you wouldn't be here. And I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just obvious fact. Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Uh, he was a man of accomplishment and considered by many one of the greatest presidents of history and one of the greatest world leaders of time. Uh, many years ago, my family and I were in London, and there in, in London, downtown London, they have a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Isn't that something? Over there in, in England, because they considered him to be such a great world leader. George Washington said that his mother was the best teacher he ever had. I've read the writings of George Washington and brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man. Well, if his teacher, his mother was his best teacher, she, she must have been brilliant as well. On Mother's Day, I want us to take us on a trip through the Bible. We are not going to be able to look at all the mothers in the Bible. That would take volumes of, of writing to do that and, and we just don't have the time in, in the little bit of uh, time that we have together. But I want to take you on a trip through the Bible to show you the miracle of mothers. So we're going to begin with the first mother, and then we're going to work our way uh, left or right through the Bible, Old Testament to New Testament, and want to look at the miracle of mothers. So we hopefully your Bible's still open to Genesis chapter 3. Go back with me to verse 8, if you will, Genesis 3 and verse 8. It says, and they, they being Adam and Eve, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, uh, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now that, that's a telling statement right there. They hid from God. Do you realize you can't hide from God? David wrote about that. He said, if I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. You can't hide from God. Jonah tried to run away from God. He found he couldn't run far enough. I've talked to many people and heard many people say over the years, well, I was running from God. Well, how absurd is that? You can't run from God. You can't get away from God. You never escape the presence of God. God is omnipresent. Uh, he's all present, present everywhere. You cannot run away from God. But Adam and Eve thought they could. They thought they could hide from the presence of the Lord. In verse 9 says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, I've said this here many times, but I think it's a good time to repeat it. God never asks a question in order to find out the answer. God, God never comes to you and I and says, you know, I've been wondering about something. I wonder if you could help me out. It's, it's something I just don't, never happens. God is not only uh, omnipresent, he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He already knows the answer. So why does he ask the question? Because he wants you and I to think about the answer. And he says to Adam, where art thou? Not that he doesn't know where Adam is. He knows exactly where Adam is. He wants Adam to think about the question. Yeah, where am I? What, how did I get here? Why am I hiding from God? Where am I? How did I, how did I get myself in this situation? Folks, it would do us a lot of good to think that kind of question through uh, periodically in our lives. Where am I right now and how did I get here? Most of the time we're going to find out that we got ourselves exactly where we are. That's what Adam discovered. In verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Isn't that something? Adam was afraid of God. There's only one thing that makes us afraid of God and that is our sinfulness. And Adam had sinned. So in verse 11, And he, the Lord, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, again, God doesn't ask this question. To, <clears throat> Adam, did you eat of that tree? No. He knows that Adam ate of the tree. He wants Adam to think, What did I do? I disobeyed God. That's what I had one. So you've heard people say today, you had one job. <laughs> Couldn't you do it right? Well, Adam had one commandment to obey, and he didn't. So verse 12, the man said, The woman, the woman that thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Isn't that something? Now, who ate Adam? So what's he doing? He's blaming Eve. He said, like, you, 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 Lord, you gave me that woman. You know how she is. She, she made me eat it. She did not. She did not. He could have said, no, Eve, I'm not taking that. You know God said we're not supposed to take that. He could have done that. It is <clears throat> the sin nature that is passed down from father to son. And our great, great, great granddaddy Adam is responsible. Uh, this blame shifting, this blame game that they play, it's, that's not valid. It doesn't work. And so, verse 13, the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So Adam says, No, it was the woman. The woman says, What me? Is that serpent? Everybody trying to shift the blame to somebody else. I have, it was given to me years ago, an original, not a, not a copy, I have an original campaign poster for Harry Truman when he was running for president. And on the bottom of that poster, it says the buck stops here. Well, that's, that's a good thing to remember. The buck stops here. Stop passing the buck. Stop blaming somebody else. Take responsibility. And so... Adam is not taking responsibility. He's blaming Eve. Eve isn't taking responsibility. She's blaming Satan. 
uh, the devil made me do it argument. So God is just going to deal with the situation as he always does. In verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Very important statement in verse 15. There will be enmity between the serpent and the woman. They will not be friends. Number two, between thy seed, the seed of the serpent, well, what do you mean seed of the serpent? You mean all the, the snakes that are born? Well, yes, you could definitely take it that way. But it's referring to something else. The serpent is Satan and the children of the devil will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. Very important statement. The seed of the woman. I told you just a little bit ago, <clears throat> excuse me, that the sin nature is passed down through the Father, and it is. If a person could be born with a mother and without a father, they would not inherit the sin nature. Was ever such a person born? Yes. Jesus of Nazareth was born of a virgin and therefore did not inherit the human sin nature. That's all stated here in the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, again, verse 15 again, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, a death blow, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Literally, the spike of the cross would have gone in through the ankle bones and bruised the heel of the one crucified. Well, that's the Lord's words to the serpent. What about Eve? Verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow. I'm sorry, let me begin again. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. Then he comes to Adam. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Adam had a choice. He had a decision to make. He can't pass the buck. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So, Adam is given a curse. The first curse is upon the serpent and the promise of the living Savior is given in that same promise. The sorrow of childbearing given to the woman does not mean that uh, mothers should not have children or that they should be sad to have children. It's speaking of the pain of childbearing. The man is told he'll grow weary in working. Understand this, work existed before the fall. Adam was told to take the Garden of Eden and dress it and keep it. Work existed before the fall, but there was not the weariness of work. And then in verse 19 again, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. In essence, what the Lord is saying to Adam here is the wages of sin is death. Adam, because you have sinned, you will die. He had told them that before. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Satan came along with his lie and said, Thou shalt not surely die. Don't worry about that. God doesn't mean that. Well, he did. He did indeed mean it. And then in verse 20, where we began, 
Adam called his wife's name Eve. The name Eve literally means the life giver. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Have you ever thought about that? You ever thought there has to be a first mother somewhere? There had to be a first human mother. And from that first human mother, we are all descended. Well, here it is. Here she is. And this is miraculous that this woman is the mother of all living. The first mother of the human race. Adam and Eve are often referred to, uh, not in scripture, but in, by theologians as our first parents. And that's exactly who they are, our first parents. Now we could say a great deal more about them, but I wanna take you to another thought here. This was the first mother. But I wanna take you to another thought, that of miraculous mothers and miraculous births. We're in Genesis chapter 3. Go to chapter 17, if you would. Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, I want you to look at, um, look at verse 18. Genesis 17 and verse 18. Abraham had been called of God, and God made a covenant back in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham to give him a land and to make of him and his seed or his descendants a great nation. Many years had gone by and Abraham uh, thought he would help God out a little bit it seems. And he and Sarah uh, concocted, his wife concocted a plot and Abraham had a child by another woman who's named Ishmael. Now there's quite a story there. We, we don't have time to go into it this morning. Uh, it was a great, great deal to be learned there. And so in Genesis 17, verse 18, Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. See, God, I have a son. Here's Ishmael. You promised to make a great nation out of my descendants. Here's Ishmael. God had a different idea. You see, the mother of Ishmael was not Abraham's wife. And Abraham had a wife. Her name was Sarah. And in verse 19, God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. This is what God had promised. God saying, I'm going to keep my word. You, you didn't need to change the plan. You didn't need to run ahead of me. You needed to trust me. God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, meaning laughter. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed are descendants after him. So God is saying to Abraham, no, Sarah is going to give you a son. It's not Ishmael. Sarah is going to give you a son, and that son is going to be the son of the covenant that I made with you, Abraham. And the promises that I made to you will be carried on through Isaac. Now that's going to take us to chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 9. It says, and they, that would be the Lord and, and two that were with him, two angels. And they said unto him, Abraham, where is Sarah thy wife? And he, Abraham, said, Behold, in the tent. Now again, the Lord's asking the question, Abraham, where's your wife? He knows where she is. He wants Abraham to think about where she is. In verse 10, And he said, I will certainly return unto thee, this is the Lord speaking, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She was beyond childbearing age. Verse 12, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, 
After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord also being old? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, uh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Look at God's answer to that. Verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Folks, it'll help you to remember that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything that God can't do? We've talked this morning about the omnipresence of God. We've talked about the omniscience of God. He's ever present. He's all knowing. But this leads us to the omnipotence of God. He is all powerful. The answer to the question, is anything too hard for the Lord, is no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Again, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed? I will return unto thee according to the time of life. The time of life for a child is uh, approximately nine months. I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So God is telling Sarah and Abram, no, you are going to have a son. Let's move over to chapter 21, Genesis chapter 21, and look at verse 1. Much obviously happens in chapters 18 and 19, but 20. But let's go on to chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. You can rest assured when God says something, when he promises something, he's going to do it. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Now remember, Sarah is past childbearing age. Well, how old was she, preacher? About 90. That's not humanly possible. You're right. That's not humanly possible. But then we have to go back to that question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? We're talking here about a miraculous birth. Something that is not of the norm. In verse 2, For Sarah conceived and bare a son, uh, bare Abraham a son, in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken unto him. Just exactly when God said it would be. And God did that, which was, again, humanly speaking, impossible. Verse 3. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, uh, uh, whom Sarah bare unto him, Isaac. Why? Because Isaac is laughter. And Sarah laughed at the promise of God. Well, that's a miraculous birth, to be sure. And Sarah to have a son exactly as the promise of God was fulfilled in keeping with the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now the next miraculous birth I want to show you is in answer to a mother's prayer. So let's take our Bible now and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 we'll look at the very first verse. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Now there was a certain man of uh, Ramathim, Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, or Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. Uh, that means he lived in the vicinity where uh, Bethlehem would be. Verse 2, and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, in biblical times, it was, and, and I'm not saying it should have been this way, I'm saying how, telling you how it was. It was a shame to a, a married woman not to have children. I don't think a woman has to be ashamed because she doesn't have children. There are many reasons why women do not have children, and it's not anything to be ashamed of, but I'm telling you the custom of the day. Verse 3, And this man went up 
out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was located. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary provoked her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And I don't know how she did it, but it must have been something like, hey, you know, notice I got children here. Notice you don't. Doesn't that make me a little bit better than you? Can I help you with that? That's not how God saw it. God did not see uh, Penina as better than Hannah, and neither should we. Verse 7, And as he, Elkanah, did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, uh, said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So, and, and you know what? He's saying, am I not a good husband to you? And we're going to assume that he was. But that didn't change her desire. Verse 9, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post for the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore and vowed a vow and said, watch your prayer here, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give thine handmaid a man child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. He'll be a Nazarite. <clears throat> we don't have time to describe that vow. Uh, Samson was a Nazarite, Samuel a Nazarite. <clears throat> but she prayed. And she prayed and asked the Lord for a son, and she promised to dedicate her son to the Lord. Verse 12, and it came to pass as she <clears throat> excuse me, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake. In her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought that she had been drunken. Now, he definitely jumped to a conclusion there. Somebody's praying, you don't hear the voice, but see their lips moving. That's called praying silently. Surely a man of Eli's experience would know that. Verse 14, Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Away, put, put thy wine away from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord. <clears throat> I am a woman of sorrow, sorrowful spirit. I have not drunk wine, neither strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Excuse me a second. Verse 15 again, Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked him. Now he didn't. Eli didn't promise her her prayer would be answered. He said, well, I go with my blessing, go in peace, and, and I, I sure am trusting that the Lord will answer your prayer. Verse 18, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Why? Because she trusted the Lord. Verse 19, And they rose up in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to to their house to Ramah, Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son. And she called his name Samuel. Samuel, meaning asked of God. 
in answer to prayer. That's what the name Samuel means. She called his name Samuel, saying, Because I asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and vow. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. Then will I bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. She wanted some time with him and to bring up just the little fella until he was old enough. And then she would keep her promise to dedicate him and his life to serving the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. Samuel goes on to become the high priest of Israel. He goes on to become the last judge of Israel. He comes, goes on to anoint the first and second kings of Israel. God used Samuel in a mighty way. But it all goes back to his mother. And Hannah's prayer for a son was answered. And the mother cared for her son. Now, I want you to take your Bible, and we're going to go uh, all the way over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, chapter 4, 2 Kings, 1 Kings. Sorry about that. 2 Kings, chapter 4, if you would. Because we've seen the first mother, we've seen the miraculous birth and and the laughter associated with Isaac. We've seen Hannah's prayers answered in Samuel. But you know, motherhood brings blessing, but it can also bring grief. I want to show you that, 2 Kings chapter 4. And the grief that comes to a mother's heart is not necessarily because the mother did anything wrong. I think it's very important to understand that. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. This is the story of Elisha. And 2 Kings 4 verse 8 says, It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, a woman of importance, a woman of some notoriety. And she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that as oft as he passed by and turned in thither to eat bread, yeah, he, turned in, he turned in through the deep bread, and she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passeth by us continually. Let us take, make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Look, I share something with you. Now, this is a tradition that's been kept. A lot of churches have built on. We are not one of them, but they, they have built onto the church a room they call a prophet's chamber where a, a visiting preacher, evangelist, missionary, whoever might have a place to stay when they're in the area. And uh, that's, that's, that's where that idea comes from. Verse 11, it fell on a day that he came and he turned into the chamber and lay there and he came to Gehazi, his servant. He said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto him, He said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. Have we not heard that before? We have, haven't we? And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood at the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, same language that the Lord used with Sarah, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. She didn't believe it. She thought he was, he was just uh, putting her on. Another miraculous birth. Verse 17. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha 
had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And that's something dad's out there working, the son gets sick, and he says, well, take him to his mother, she'll take care of him. That's, that's pretty typical, isn't it, folks? Verse 20, and when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Now this woman is heartbroken. But understand, though she's heartbroken, her faith is not gone. Verse 21, And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. He doesn't even know his son has died. Verse 24, then she saddled an ass and said unto her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding, except I bid thee. She went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her far off, he said to Gehazi's servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Now how could she say that? Because she has faith. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Now, you see, the, the situation here is this. She said, Look, I prayed and you asked me and I told you the prayer of my heart and you told me I would have a son and I did, but now he's gone. Is this your deception? Is this what happens? Now, understand, she's not speaking because she has no faith, she's speaking this way because her heart's broken. If she had no faith, she wouldn't even be there. We're going to skip a little bit for the, the sake of time. And Elisha goes, verse 32, goes to her house. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon the child and the child uh, upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. You see, the Lord not only answered her prayer in giving her a son, but the Lord answered her prayer and turned her tears to praise the servant we skipped this part the servant Gehazi could not help the child the man of God could help the child but only when he prayed and we're told that Elisha was a man of prayer James makes an example of that and said Elisha was a man of like passion such as we are he was just a man but when he prayed things happened he was a great man of prayer now let's go to the New Testament. If you will, go to Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I want to look at another miraculous birth. And it seems to be a, sort of a common thing in these miraculous births that we read about in the Bible that the people are elderly people or older people. Those beyond the age of what would normally be the time for childbearing. In Luke chapter 1, I want to begin in verse 5. 
Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Uh, that's significant. His daughter, uh, wife, Elizabeth, is a descendant of the priestly line, as is her husband. He would have to be. She would not have to be, but she was. God had a hand in that. Verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. Now that's an important statement. This was a godly couple who loved the Lord. But it says they were both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were now, both were now well stricken in years just like Abraham and Sarah they were beyond the normal age of childbearing uh, look very quickly if you will down at verse 25 thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach young, among men this is Elizabeth speaking back to verse 8 and it came to pass that while he, Zechariah, executed the priest office before God in order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went in to the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him the angel of the Lord standing on the right hand of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. And we've talked about that recently here. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. A miraculous birth, a miraculous son, a man greatly used of God, like Isaac, and like Samuel, and now John. Verse 14, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, or Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers and the children and to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Zechariah says, well, I don't know. How am I going to know this is going to happen? And the angel tells him, well, Zechariah, uh, it's going to happen. We told you that. You need to believe it. So you're not going to be able to say a word till it happens. And that's precisely how it came to pass. But we come down to verse 24. Elijah, uh, I'm sorry, Zacharias finished his work in the temple. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, The Lord hath dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach young men, uh, among men. Verse 26 takes us to the next miraculous birth. You know this one. We will not spend as much time on it. It says in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, 
and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A sign is given to the king. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And we've told you this many times before. Some have tried to minimize the miracle there and say, well, it, the word virgin there could have been translated young woman. So uh, let's see. Uh, God's going to give a sign to the king. A young woman's going to have a son. Happens every day, folks. Not to minimize motherhood. We'll come back to that in a moment. But that's not a tremendous sign. But for the Lord to say a virgin shall conceive a bare son, that's a sign because that, like the birth of Isaac, like the birth of John the Baptist, like the birth of Samuel, like the birth of the Shunammite son, that's a miraculous birth. That's God doing what humans are not capable of doing. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Skip down to verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Go back to verse 36. And thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And verse 39, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost and he spake she spake with a loud voice and said blessed art thou among women blessed is the fruit of thy womb now here is the miraculous conception and birth of the Savior I'm going to tell you that is the greatest miraculous birth of all time. I don't think I need to tell you that, but it may help you. But we read in verses 39 to 41 where these unborn babies recognized each other. One of them newly conceived and the other one six months along in development, but they recognized each other. That certainly answers the question. Uh, and should for anybody's mind as to whether the baby in the womb is, is a living person. Quite obviously so. But I want to close with these thoughts this morning. Mothers are a gift to us. And every birth is in a sense a miraculous birth. Every mother when she gives birth goes down and faces the possibility of her own passing. And sad to say many times that has happened. Mothers are a gift to us. Mothers influence us like nobody else. And they guide their children. And so it ought to be, as we've read about these women, particularly uh, most recently, Elizabeth and Mary, that every mother ought to desire to be a godly mother. Every mother can be a godly mother. Every mother ought to be a godly mother. Every mother ought to desire to be a godly mother. Well, how do I do that? Well, the first thing you need to do is be saved. To know that your sins are forgiven. To know that you're a child of God. Remember back in Genesis when we were looking at the first mother and there was chapter 3, verse 15, where God said there would be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman, the virgin birth, talk about the Messiah, the seed of the serpent. John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus said, ye are of your father the devil. Now who was he talking to? Well actually he was talking to a group of very religious people. So the problem wasn't that they weren't religious, they were very religious. The problem was that they were not saved. The problem was that they trusted in their own righteousness, their own good deeds. They were self-righteous. But they needed, as Jesus said five chapters before that, they needed to be born again. 
Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's a miracle enough. But there's the miracle of the second birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he said, marvel not that I said unto thee. Don't be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. He tells us how to do that. He tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, anybody who would believe in him, trust in him. Trust him to do what? Trust that he is the Savior, the Messiah, that he paid for our sins at the cross, that he buried and he rose again the third day. That is the gospel. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember Adam was told that part of his curse was he came from dust, he going back to dust. He was told that when he sinned, the day he sinned, he would begin to die. Paul puts it this way. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Same writer in the same book says this. But God commendeth or sent forth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the first thing a godly mother needs to do is to be saved. To trust the Lord Jesus Christ and have her sins forgiven. Know that she's going to heaven. Secondly, she needs to be surrendered to the Lord. And to be surrendered to the Lord, we've seen that in many of these, but I think the great example of it was here in Luke 1, 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. You know what she's saying? Lord, I'm, I'm here. I'm yours. Let my life be in your hands. And then the godly mother must be serving. Serving God, of course, and also serving others. I think it's safe to say most mothers serve others. We ought also to serve God. But let me go back to the thought. Mothers are a gift to us. They're a gift to us from God. And so God tells us to honor our mother. And we ought to love our mother. And when Jesus was on the cross, one of his final thoughts before he gave up the ghost was of his mother. Where well, he looked down at John, and in essence, these were not his words, but in essence, he said, John, I'm going away now. I need somebody to take care of mother. You let her come and live with you at your house, John. And he looked at his mother and said, Mother, I'm not going to be here. You go live with John. He'll take care of you. And so he did. And so he did. We cannot overestimate the value of a mother. We cannot overestimate the miracle of mothers. And so it is honorable and appropriate that we have this holiday called Mother's Day. But all of that comes about because it's God's plan. All of that comes about because we have a creator God who loves us. And though we are separated from him by sin, he gave a plan of salvation to bring us back to him. And he did give his only begotten son. And he did say that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We ought to trust the Lord as Savior. And then we ought to follow him with a full heart. Then we will have his blessing. Let's pray together. Father.